Um, we use end-to-end -end encryption, sandboxing, and access control as primary measures. We talked about the TVB on eBrain, uh, sorry, about the uh, eBrain's core services, um, a file system, a wiki, office services, um, a Jupyter Lab interface, um, the OpenShift um, container and um, cloud uh, management system, and our high performance backends that are all connected via a RESTful um, API using Unicore. And um, uh, these connect the different deployments of the different TVB services. We have different deployments of TVB um, for our different services. And um, so we we went through uh, the different services and showed an example of um, the TVB web GUI service. And then um, we talked about uh, the pipeline processing and especially um, how this can be protected. So the essential workflow of uh, cloud processing um, requires that data is uploaded over the internet um, onto uh, um, computers uh, that are connected to the internet and um, also um, to high performance computers that have uh, increased um, storage and computing facilities. And that in this uh, uh, in this cloud infrastructure, we configure um, workflows and we run these workflows, and then we download um, our results. And um, uh, during the whole time, actually, we tried to have our data encrypted, except for the processing itself, um, where we put them in a sandbox to protect them from um, uh, from being uh, stolen. Um, so on a very, very high level, um, uh, we can be, uh, data transfers can be intercepted. And um, also one can directly basically break in on a device because we are using uh, shared resources. Uh, we are working on the same computer on the same network and um, isolation between different spaces happens mostly on a logical level um, and um, is therefore often um, penetratable. So um, there are uh, maybe loopholes no one is aware of. And um, encryption is one of the most important technologies for data privacy. Uh, we would like to have personal data always encrypted and unencrypted personal data should never be written out on a disk directly. So within a temporary mount file system that is invisible from the host, we would make an exception and allow that. Um, so ideally, unencrypted data only exists uh, in a main memory of a um, protected process. Um, so the memory is also protected. It's not a shared memory block. Um, there are um, semaphores or whatever which block these memory areas. Um, from accession by other um, tenants. Um, so the, uh, we make heavy use of um, um, uh, public-private uh, uh, cryptography. So we um, generate key pairs where one part of the key can be safely transmitted over open networks, um, which um, makes things a lot easier. Um, and yeah, we, we require that um, processing always happens within sandboxes. So sandboxes provide only a controlled set of resources to a process. Um, the, um, the full namespace of resources and capabilities and, um, and, on, and operating systems um, is uh, basically mapped um, onto a, a table basically controls which of these um, uh, resources you can access. And this um, it's a Linux feature, basically. So um, Linux uh, user namespaces make it possible that uh, we can um, isolate. So in Linux, everything is uh, related to files and to identifiers. And with these user namespaces, we can isolate these identifiers, security-related identifiers, from our identifiers. And this even allows us, for example, to act as a root user inside such a shielded container, even if outside uh, we um, cannot be a root and we cannot escalate 
this um, permissions. So uh, this was uh, really introduced into the Python kernel. So this is uh, uh, into the Linux kernel. So this is a uh, um, really a deep OS module, a deep infrastructure um, for this kind of uh, isolation. Um, and this really stretches over all different kinds of namespaces. So the inter-process communication, the table of processes, um, the uh, network connections, um, and even host names and so on, um, can be basically arbitrarily changed with this feature for uh, individual process trees. And um, this would then lead um, to a workflow that may look like this. Is there someone asking a question? No. Um, this would then lead to a, a workflow like this. Uh, we have three entities, a data controller. Um, or these are computers. Uh, uh, and this computer is uh, the computer of the data controller or data processor. Um, which is under GDPR the only legal entity allowed uh, to handle this data. So we are trying to make workflows that are basically uh, independent of persons other than uh, controllers or processors um, and which basically happen in isolated areas of machines that are um, inaccessible to humans. So um, we uh, start by authenticating with the eBrains cloud via using this Keycloak um, account management system. We get a uh, bearer token, which allows us to authenticate with our MAP supercomputing account that we have with a Phoenix supercomputer somewhere in the background. And um, so now we um, can open up a shell on this computer. Um, so we can, with Unicorp, basically interact with the supercomputer in more or less the same way we would interact with them when we get um, a remote shell with SSH, for example. And at this stage, we can do all these kinds of things like pulling containers and so on. Um, and when the actually um, privacy uh, sensitive part starts, we start a sandbox. So. Um, privacy related processing only is only allowed to happen inside sandboxes and never out, uh, outside. Um, the next step, we create public private key pairs, one pair on the supercomputer in the sandbox, never is written out uh, into a normal file system and only uh, lives as a variable in main memory. Um, and uh, the same on the data controller's computer. Here we are not so restrictive. Um, we, it's the responsibility of the data controller to secure their own computer, just like it's their responsibility to make sure that their password doesn't leak out. So we have now um, public-private keys um, pairs. Um, the one key pair created on the supercomputer, uh, or the public key, at least gets transmitted to the data controller so that the data controller can encrypt their data and send it or upload it to the supercomputer. And the other key pair from the data controller will later be used to encrypt the uh, results and um, move them to the data controller's computer. Now that we encrypted the personal data, uh, made it unreadable, we upload it um, first into this eBrains drive and from there we can forward it with with Unicore um, onto the supercomputer. Uh, we may put it on a login node or into some high performance storage file system. Then, um, uh, so this um, uh, sandbox is like the root process of the entire pipeline processing. And this process never um, uh, gives back control. So um, this uh, process runs and um, it synchronizes um, periodically with the front end um, to make sure everyone is on the same page and to detect any errors. If any error is detected, the whole thing will immediately stop and delete everything and everything will be lost and the whole process has to start over again from scratch with the creation of two new key pairs. So these key pairs are really only valid for this short amount of time and this uh, short workflow. If anything happens in between, we start over again. And um, 
then uh, we securely uh, got our data into a temporary mount file system within the sandbox. There we decrypt the data, perform the pipeline processing. So here we have three containers that uh, all can, um, uh, uh, they all have bind mounts with this temporary file system and can copy the data uh, and reuse the data. And then the results are again encrypted. And here we, then we can uh, move them over to the data controller, who is the only uh, entity ideally with a, that has the private key to um, decrypt them. Okay, so this is um, this is the high level overview over this um, encrypted secured sandbox um, pipeline processing. Something similar happens uh, with TVB when you upload uh, your structural connectomes. TVB, um, yes, so this is the recapitulation of uh, the most important points of our first hour today. And I think we ended uh, on this slide um, where we talked about um, TVB inverse and the virtual epileptic patient. And this leaves us with the last um, TVB on eBrain service, which is TVB ready data. Uh, so what comes out of the TV image processing pipeline is TVB ready data. And um, so one data set, we saw this earlier, is already curated and available in eBrain's knowledge graph. Um, this data set contains, um, we mentioned that, pre and post overlift data of two more patients, 31 patients, 11 controls, and we have structural and functional connectomes and region average of my time series um, with this account, Liani Atlas and also the fitted parameters in order to reproduce um, the publication by um, Hannelore Erz um, and um, Daniele Marinazzo. Um, then these two uh, data sets we are in the process of creating. It's the one is the APNI data set, the other one is the Human Connectome Project data set. Um, the APNI data set contains um, data from 33 participants including um, patients uh, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, with mild cognitive impairments and also healthy controls. Um, and there we have processed MRI and parcelated PET images. Um, this was done in uh, Stefanowski et al, um, where uh, PET imaging results um, were used to inform the parameter values of the brain network model, um, um, uh, particularly nice approach to constrain uh, brain network models with empirical data. And um, here we have also simulation results, services, and an EG projection matrix to map um, the raw time series on a neural level uh, to the EG. And with the human connectome project data, we have data from 785 healthy young um, persons. Um, here we have um, structural and functional connectivity again and region average FMI time series. This was um, generated using the Glaser pass relation um, together with subcortical regions as identified by free surface subcortical segmentation, which yields 379 regions. And all of this was pre processed with the HCP minimal uh, processing pipeline, um, which in my view summarizes a lot of the best practices um, of current MRI pre-processing. Okay, and um, this is the last uh, um, addition to the services, um, the Atlas viewer, um, which, which is basically, so, so in the first sense, it is a viewer, um, which also uh, conveys some knowledge, which was also used in museum exhibitions. And now it uh, gets a second usage um, for visualizing and, um, and, and rendering um, uh, uh, new Atlas connections, which is another uh, part of the eBrains project where simulators or simulation services get connected to Atlas services um, in order to uh, inform brain models, for example, with uh, pseudo-architectonic um, information. For example, like we have it in the big brain um, atlases and uh, the other atlases in eBrains. Knowledge graph and open minds metadata. Uh, so this was the rightmost part of um, this uh, workflow overview diagram we saw. 
Um, and there we saw that the outputs of the TVB processing pipeline, again, get ingested into um, a graph database. And there is also um, annotation of uh, the processing results with metadata in open minds format. Um, and we have uh, here this knowledge graph, which also um, allows visual exploration of uh, the database content and programmatic uh, querying of the database um, and metadata. And um, this then again informs all the other services, basically not only TVB on eBrain services, but also the other services. So what is a knowledge graph? Um, this is eBrain's uh, way of storing knowledge. I think the term was coined by Google when uh, suddenly to the right of the search results there appeared this um, this new panel where they show some comprehensive uh, information about uh, the search, um, the Google search. And um, this uh, is a successful concept reused in other um, operations. Um, Bluebrain Nexus has a nice implementation of this. Uh, so a knowledge graph is a graph. Uh, the nodes are entities. Um, really could be all kind of real world objects. And edges are uh, relations uh, between these objects. So since this is a knowledge graph, the relations are knowledge. So um, uh, how uh, basically these entities are uh, interrelated in the relationship encodes this knowledge. And um, in order to talk about um, these entities, we need a vocabulary um, and, and their relations. And um, this is an, an ontology so we have classes of objects with, that can have attributes and that can have relations and rules that govern relations um, and axioms that are like uh, the foundation for uh, certain things that can all be computed. Um, so this knowledge graph also allowed the, com the computing and ideally the generation of new knowledge. And um, yeah, this, uh, for this we need <clears throat> such ontologies. And um, to put our words um, meaningfully together, uh, we need a syntax. And uh, this is JSON LD. Um, JSON LD is uh, uh, like a very popular format, uh, key value pair format, um, basically with some structure and um, uh, also with linkage. So JSON LD links together different um, files or concepts, which can be um, also abstractly defined. So um, what I'm showing here um, is how we curated or are in the process of curating the HCP um, HCP data set I just showed. Um, we upload with 700 plus subjects. This is Open Minds version 1.0. And um, since then, there was an update. And um, this um, may not confirm, uh, conform to the uh, latest um, Open Minds version. So I uh, didn't update myself. I'm not sure whether we are at the end yet. Um, so um, this is this is this worked um, and uh, just bear in mind that it may, may already be outdated. It also shows really just the minimal the minimum the bare minimum of how a data set uh, would be um, provided with metadata in this case. So um, we have a tree um, and here this is our metadata file schema. Um, we have a data set which describes information about the data set. We have specimen group, uh, which is our um, experimental subjects. And these subjects are individually listed uh, here with their, uh, and specified with their metadata. So let's have just a brief glimpse into how such a file may look like. So these are types, which are defined by the schemas. Um, and uh, with ideas, we can link these together. This is JSON ALD. Um, and then we uh, start with specifying metadata. Here we have a name for the data set, a description. Um, Ebrains has the concept of owners and contributors and um, an embargo status. Uh, specimen group. And this is, we'll just see, this is a link to this file, basically. Uh, we have license, which also have um, schema IDs. And uh, the specimen group is just our group of subjects. They are all cognitively normal, healthy. And um, yeah, this basically just 
links to all these um, subject files. And yeah, as I said, this is like the bare minimum of metadata. Uh, we have here an age range, um, a subject identifier, um, a sex, and a species. Okay. Um, and in order, so when we created this data set, there was no um, software to create such metadata JSON LD collections. And um, I think now there was some action in the GitHub repository. I seem to have seen some um, new software there since a few days now. Um, but this is like our quick and, quick and dirty solution to produce uh, metadata for curation. Um, so a Python dictionary is very simpler, similar to a JSON notation. Um, and there is easy back and forth conversion. So um, the, the whole notation of a, a Python dictionary and of a JSON object is more or less yeah, very similar. And uh, we can just like convert back and forth with this uh, import, uh, with this JSON um, package from Python. And so this is what we did. Um, we um, import JSON. We read some metadata from um, the bits uh, data structure that we have from our subjects. Um, and then we generate, this is, yeah, basically, it's not very elegant. Well, we <laughs> we automate, automate what we would have done manually, basically. So we generate the directories, we create files, uh, and we fill these files, basically with the information um, that is needed. So we create here these schema um, uh, 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 blueprints and then they are filled with the information and then they're converted to JSON and written out. Uh, we have this published, but I think, meanwhile, open minds changed uh, so much and also there is software out, so um, this may be outdated already. Okay, and this was now really the final word on TBB on eBrain's workflows. And um, the last part now would be a, um, a proposal uh, how to extend the BITS uh, data standard. Um, so let's start with a short introduction to BITS. Um, BITS is the brain imaging data structure. Um, was um, uh, uh, first realized a few years ago and um, made a lot of sense to a lot of people um, so i find it also um yeah it, it makes a lot of sense what they're doing so it's uh, um i really uh, support this wholeheartedly and um, um yeah like these concepts a lot so let's let's um look at the concepts basically um so what is the, the motivation basically for a, a common standard um, neural imaging, uh, uh, as probably most uh, in this call know, experiments produce complicated data in many modalities. So um, you have your MRI data, you have EG data, depending on the um, on the on the system. You have different data formats, uh, different software packages with different data formats. So um, there's a lack of standards, and this leads to errors and wasted time. When we have standards, it's much easier to understand uh, a data set and to reuse a data set and to spot errors in a data set. Um, so this is important for um, reproducibility. In order to reproduce results, we need an exact description of the inputs, the applied transformations, and the outputs. Um, and when, when one looks in a paper, um, so even when it's specified in a very detailed manner, um, there will be some parameters or procedures that um, are missing or hard to determine from the paper. Um, and uh, this is not only a problem of science at large, um, like uh, the, the replication crisis, which was announced um, a few months ago, but this really regularly happens uh, within the same laboratory or the same person. So if you work for years, um, and uh, some and some they have to uh, revisit some old work, um, so it's likely that you don't understand what you did back then, or at least at some point have some problems uh, with reusing your old stuff again. Um, 
So in the really extreme case, it is even possible that rerunning the same code on the same machine at a different time can lead to failure of reproduction. Um, so when the software interface changes, um, when computational environments changes, um, uh, there are so so each of these softwares re relies on um, an endless tree of dependencies and other softwares, and um, for example, often random numbers are involved. And um, so just a change in the random number generator uh, or in the random number precision, for example, can uh, lead uh, to huge errors, um, specifically with um, numerically so um, uh, yeah, so, so problematic uh, systems like the ones we are working with, uh, which yeah, may be simply numerically unstable and where even small errors lead to a failure of reproduction. Or there's often also the example that there is a software package that everyone uses and everyone produces good results with it. And then they discover a bug. And when this bug is gone, suddenly all the results are gone. And this is a reality. Um, robustness uh, would be a motivation, therefore, for our data structure. A good structure would enable us uh, to spot errors more easily. Um, and maybe even to automatically validate um, our data and our metadata. And uh, things like redundancy and cross-checking and the structural integrity validation may help us uh, with this. OK, and now let's talk about bits in a nutshell. Um, bits can be really easily described. And this is also um, why, why I think it makes a lot of sense. So when I first saw bits, um, it reminded me a lot, a, a lot, a lot um, of how people just organize their data. So when uh, I saw this schema a lot in different people who just uh, did it without probably knowing of each other and then say um, made it into a standard. So this is really nice. So when what you get out of a um, MRI scanner, um, the DICOM, DICOM um, folder is usually not really human readable or interpretable. And what you usually do as a first step after you um, scan your subjects, you bring some um, structure into your data. So you typically um, sort the runs according to their uh, sequence uh, information. So here we have anatomical data, which is high resolution T1 weighted like MPH data. And here we have functional data. So these would um, be our, um, uh, our fMRI bold runs, for example. And here we would have diffusion weighted data. And this is also split up with subjects, according to subjects, with clear identifiers, and also a table that um, already gives us some metadata. So um, if you did research in neuroimaging in the last uh, years, I guess, you would have likely encountered such a structure. Um, so important is a directory structure, some sorting a directory, and then we have a file name structure. The file name should basically already describe uh, what is in the file. Um, and here we see it, uh, all the files start uh, with the subject identifier. Um, and uh, also we have a form of redundancy. So we, we know already that it's um, functional data, but here the last keyword here is bold again, or here is, in the DWI folder, we also have just the redundancy. The folder is already in DWI, but also all the files are identified as DWI um, so that um, we have more and more checks, basically. And um, the file name already, already characterizes what is in the file with key value pairs, very similar to a metadata file. So here we have uh, a key um, word task, and the task was resting state. And uh, the other principle is that um, data files are co-located with sidecar files that um, contain um, metadata specifications of these data files. So we have here the same file stem. Here we have here four files that have all the same file stem, but different file endings. So these three are um, data files. And then the file with the ending JSON is a metadata file that describes the metadata. Um, of these three data files. 
and we have standardized data formats. This is um, uh, the last important ingredient. Um, we would like to come down to a small number of um, different file types um, and not 100 different. So this is the purpose of a standard um, to agree on a, uh, a common structure. So um, let me repeat. Uh, our common principles are we have a file name structure, a chain of entities, and key value pairs, and a suffix, and an extension, and we have a directory structure. So here, again, an example with a, a slightly bigger example, a slightly more complete example. We have another, again, anatomical functional diffusion uh, data, and here is a field map um, for, for artifact correction. And here we have a folder code already, um, which contains um, some code that may be used in um, processing this data set. And then here we have a folder derivatives. Uh, this was uh, once a bits extension proposal and is now um, already part of the standard. So um, this would be a raw data set. Uh, this is basically after some initial cleaning up, basically the, um, the starting point. And everything uh, which is processed from such a raw data set would be then stored as a derivative data set, basically. And here we have um, top level meta, um, uh, metadata files, participants, uh, a data set description, readme, and changes. So um, again, the idea is to have a reduced set of file types. So um, we don't come around having some sort of imaging files. And the bit standard says all imaging files must be stored as nifty format. So this is basically, again, the nifty format is again a header with metadata and basically just the raw image cube, just the numbers basically. And uh, then we have tabular data. Mo uh, very often we encounter basically the data that has some form of some table form or matrix or vector form. So uh, we have need to store data that is somehow two-dimensionally structured. And we do this with this um, tabular files. And then we have key value files, dictionaries, uh, and metadata files. So um, this is how it started, actually. This is how bits started. Um, the idea was initially to keep it to a low number of files. But then um, things got a bit out of hand. And there came a lot of new file types and stuff. Anyway. Um, this is just a, a short overview again. I think by now um, you know what I'm talking about. So we have here this uh, data set description, so a, a high level description of the data set. Here we have a readme file with some textual descriptions. We have a changes file, um, which is also nice for reproducibility, of course. So every time um, a change was made to a data set, we would like to record this. We would like to, pro to track the provenance of the data set. Um, and we um, need a license also. Um, and um, this uh, spawned then basically the bit standard spawned uh, bits validators. So now that we have a standard, we can also um, implement programs that basically check whether a data set conforms to the standard, um, uh, which is very nice because um, now, um, yeah, we get an instance basically for error correction. And um, this is really what we need in order to address the problem of creeping errors in data sets. And um, when we talk about um, problems with data sets, we may um, think about that with three levels um, of reproducibility. So when um, I read a paper and uh, may start to uh, reproduce the results. The first step may be to just, um, so I pull the code from GitHub, install it on my machine, and what I do, I really just rerun the same code in exactly the same way as reported. Um, this should um, usually, so the idea is that this should work. Um, so in journals nowadays, it is required that, uh, so in, in good journals, it is required that you um, provide the code with your data. And um, this may not be enough. So um, you download the result. You just really want to repeat the exact same thing. Just click one button, and it still doesn't work. So um, but the author didn't tell you that there is a whole environment of things you need around in order to use this code. 
So just the code is not enough. Then um, rerunning the same code while varying parameters, uh, this would be the next step. So now I am got familiar with um, how the experiment was done and now I want to vary it a little bit to see what else I can do with it um, and to maybe to get to the limits of, of what was shown here. And um, this uh, requires already much deeper understanding. So now I really need to know what are the inputs, how are they structured, um, what exactly happens to the data and how are the outputs done and how are the parameters, what is their structure, how do they influence the processing of this data. So I need at this stage already a lot more information, I need a lot more um, understanding of the data and the processes involved in the data, in, in, in um, transforming the data. And um, this would be like um, the, the highest target. So this would basically be um, the result, uh, the desired target for maximal reproducibility. Um, basically, if you imagine um, the whole world burns down, um, everything is lost, all the computers is lost, and everything, the whole infrastructure is lost, we should still be able to build it up based on these uh, descriptions, basically. So this was an extreme example, but um, the idea is basically you should be able to recreate the entire science behind this result um, in a completely different environment, um, in a, on a, with a different computing lang uh, computer language, for example, with a different hardware, with different algorithms. Um, uh, so often results really depend a lot on how exactly they were, impl they were implemented. So this is uh, with um, nonlinear systems where uh, small changes can lead to huge uh, results, huge changes. Uh, this can happen uh, very often that just the choice of how something was implemented actually determined the whole science result. And no one was clear about that actually. So um, the ultimate goal for reproducibility is to recreate everything from scratch on a different system basically and this requires really a lot so re here we really need to be very specific about the equations the function definitions the algorithms and it must be um, very precisely and very clearly communicated at the theory and also the implementation um, and this um, uh, um, yeah was uh, so, so uh, yeah this this quote basically nicely summarizes this an article about computational science is not the scholarship itself, it is merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. So unless you are able um, to, come to do everything that uh, leads to a reproduction of the article of the figures, um, you cannot say that you re reproduce the results. And um, containerization technology made um, life a lot easier in this regard, um, but only really targets the first level of reproducibility. So here we get our stable software environment uh, delivered with us. Um, so with containers, we should now be more or less sure um, we aren't um, uh, that uh, reproducibility is possible. Yeah, in practice, there will certainly things that be things discovered that even with containers it's even not the first level maybe um, possible. So really in order to reproduce these higher levels um, of, of the science basically, not just of the, techni the, the technology that enabled the science, so this, but of the science, you really need a clear specification of the science, of the model, such that it can be repl replicated in a completely different environment and um, can also be compared with other implementations. So um, really the ultimate goal for reproducible science is that we have the same science, but represented on different technologies. So we would something like a tooling complete, something like a implementation independent formulation of science basically. Only when our formulation of our knowledge is independent from the symbols and the implementation, then we can be one rung on the ladder of sureness, be more sure <laughs> that this is something that is reproducible in the future. And in order to address this big problem, 
um, several people met in 2019 in um, Princeton and uh, talked about um, how uh, this could be implemented for a wide class of different um, uh, uh, models used in neuroscience. Um, so uh, this is, for example, uh, uh, to the left, there are people uh, involved with TVB, here's Petra, John Griffiths, and Randy McIntosh. And I also recognize people which are involved with dynamic uh, causal modeling. This is Rosalind Moran. So these are, um, what, we are, what we want is a standard that not only works for TVB, but also for dynamic causal modeling and for all kinds of um, uh, neural simulators or neural networks, and maybe even more than that. But we'll come to that in a second. Um, so uh, two broad classes of extensions would be needed to reach uh, this goal. Um, so we need input and output data for different classes of models. These must be adhered to a standard. And um, we would need a language to describe our models, basically in a reproducible format um, that makes it also more or less independent from this language, but that can uh, that leads to conversions between different languages, basically. So we want some automatic code generation, automatic implementations of the same model in different environments. If this would pop out of this, um, I think the, um, uh, this, many people would be very happy. And um, uh, this also uh, allows um, easy inspection comparison with other models. Um, but uh, a, a problem that stands in the way of realizing such a goal is that we somehow need to balance the expressivity of such a language against the simplicity. So we want a language that can express many different things with a, um, with a very simple vocabulary, with a very simple setup. Because if we go the other way um, and uh, have a very uh, uh, complex uh, language, then this is what we are already now. Our language is already complex, too complex. We have too many formats. We want to make our language simpler and agree on um, something simpler, basically. So can a compact specification capture the full breadth of computational models is the question here. And the idea from the Princeton meeting is that we could express models in the form of a computational graph where each node of the graph is a function that is to be carried out and the edges um, describe how information between these functions is the input output relationships between these functions basically so we um, the edge specifies uh, what is the argument of the function and what is the result of the function and um, uh, with this with such a graph we can basically encode a very wide range of computational objects of computational workflows basically and um, I'm pretty sure you also noticed now that this is basically the way we also represent brain networks, right? So this is how we understand brains. This is how we conceptualize brains. We interpret brains as a collection of nodes that perform functions and their connections. So here we would at the same time um, model brains and all kinds of computations, all kinds of computational workflows, basically. Um, this is just to give an overview that many such um, bits extensions are on the way. Um, there's also already a bits model specification standard on the way, but this is dedicated for um, stat models, general linear models um, used for um, uh, fMRI uh, analysis, for example. Okay, um, now let's actually have a look at the actual proposal. Um, so we, now that we motivated this and um, 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 talked a little we, we, I think we yielded a set of constraints um, that a wish list for our standards. So um, we require for full reproducibility an explicit specification of the mathematical equations, the physical concepts, the particular software and implementations used for producing the result, including function definitions, algorithms, parameters, and viral settings. Um, ideally, we would want to have some form of version control and provenance tracking. So we want to know um, how um, a data set evolved over time and what changes were made to the data set. Uh, we need to exactly know that. And ideally, um, we may also end up uh, with a solution that helps for data privacy. Um, and um, yeah, this should not only work for TVB or large scale models, but um, for all kinds of neural simulators or concepts or computations 
and we would like to avoid an over specialization and to not end up again with hundreds of file types and classes and substandards basically which would defy the whole purpose so from these constraints we can again derive some organizing principles for example Short file names are advantages because in, in um, this inter instance. So we saw earlier bits uses these key value pairs for describing the content of a file. But computational models have many parameters. So if we now start to distinguish our model outputs based on long lists of such characteristics, then the defining characteristic will be some verb buried in a swarm of such key value pairs. And a human reader will have a hard time to parse this. And to understand what is actually the defining characteristic of a particular file. And um, another principle is generality. If we now again start to tune these key value pairs towards a specific software product or as framework, this would again defy uh, the idea of having a generic standard. And yeah, an example to what it could lead basically. So, um, this is a, a, a very long file name, and this is not even the, the actual file name. This is um, the regular expression um, to build the file name. So the actual labels are likely to be much longer than what is shown here. So we end up with enormously long, long files if we try to describe the content of a file, of a, at least of, of the files we are working with, based on such lists of key value pairs. And here also, this is from an um, extension proposal. So this is really a very long list of diffusion models. So in the last years, basically, every paper that comes out um, has their own diffusion model. OK, this was a bit exaggerated, but there are lots of diffusion models. And um, basically, last year, they came up with a diffusion model. And next year, no one uses it anymore. So what's the cutoff? How do we decide which of these um, 20,000 diffusion models we now uh, include again in our standard. Um, and this is what happened here. So initially, um, when people thought about how to extend the standard, they made a comprehensive li list of models. And then they said, oh, OK, now it's, about, now it's quite long. So now we have to cut off again. But where could we put the threshold? So there are problems um, when we do it like this. So um, maybe when we think about what actually is in these files and what actually underlies all the different data types. So even if we go into these different models of diffusion um, data and all these different data types, if we just look what is really in these different files, and it actually is most of the time the same. So most of the time, it's these are network graphs. Um, so we have a description of a network, some graph, nodes, and connections. Then we have mathematical equations or systems of mathematical equations. We have computer code. Um, and we have 1D and 2D data vectors or matrices, basically. So, um, so uh, or we could also have higher dimensional tensors. But um, usually, we could then, again, break it down into a two-dimensional format. So this is like um, some basic uh, uh, concept we could agree on. And la uh, later, we can again divide these, um, so these 1D and 2D matrices, basically um, bunches of numbers. We can again um, divide them into objects that primarily extend into space, like maps, versus um, objects that extend into time, like time series. So um, the last point, we um, the, the 1D and 2D data vectors and matrices, um, we um, this uh, divides them again into temporal objects, into spatial objects, and their coordinates uh, of their respective um, spaces. Uh, and this basically, this uh, very simple set of uh, data types. So this is now very basic again. This is like the, the other opposite um, of over specialization. So this is now really general. Um, but all of this can be done uh, with just two file types, with um, the, exactly those file types that were specified in the original bit standard as, this, as the desired way to store information. And um, so instead of long lists of key value pairs, we would use short and concise file names with an intuitive label. Um, so we could maybe start out when we create a file, we give it an intuitive labels like 
Um, this was run for of my second pipeline with parameter x set to something. So this would we would know what this is about. Um, and the whole metadata, the, the complete information, um, so that everyone else would know what this is about, um, would then be stored in the JSON metadata sidecar file. And then um, we could um, go one step further and add unique IDs to the file names. Um, so now um, the idea was to have long lists of key value pairs in order to distinguish files, but now uh, we end up with the problem that we produce many files and we need to uh, uniquely identify and to distinguish them. So here we would now need, uh, add um, a short um, string to the files, a uh, unique ID, and now um, comes uh, 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 to, yeah, the, the central point, basically. This ID could itself be a hash of the metadata file, of the JSON sidecar file. So um, 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 I, I guess you have heard of the concept of checksums. A checksum is that um, I compute the sum over the content of a file. So if a file, for example, contains alphanumeric characters, um, they have a Unicode representation, I compute the sum over this. And, uh, when I die, um, I can compare my received result, the checksum, with the checksum that was generated by um, the creator of the file. And this is the usual way to check the integrity of a transmission of data. And um, now we can basically extend this concept to also include the integrity of the metadata. So if our ID is a hash of the um, JSON sidecar file, we always know, we always can cross validate basically. We always know um, whether um, the metadata um, or the data, so the metadata again contains a checksum, a hash of the data file. So we have in the respective files um, hashes or checksums of the um, content of the partner. So we can always cross check and validate whether the information in the other file is correct and up to date. So a future bits validator could um, work in the form of like a, um, a registry and, and file manipulation could uh, take the shape of a transactional process. Um, you don't simply manipulate a file, but um, you manipulate a file and then you have to make a transaction of this manipulation. So um, you cannot simply tamper with the file, you can't simply change it. Every change will be recorded. Every change requires a validation step. collect exactly what you did. Um, for example, combined with difference tracking like in GitHub. And um, so um, we end up uh, with a unique, uh, we end up with a unique identifiability and with checksum ID that then meet with mutual checksums and some form of transactional registry where every transformation involves updating checksums and ideas that can be direct tracked in a registry. So this could also take the shape of a worldwide registry, basically, where um, every manipulation of a data set needs to be registered. This is not necessary. This could also be local databases. But in, base, in principle, it's not possible to simply manipulate a data set. A manipulation of a data set is a component by a lock by keeping track of what happened. And with this, we should be able to create a chain um, of, of provenance information, basically. And we enforce rigorously uh, structural validity. It's, it, would be it won't be possible to have an invalid data set anymore. Otherwise, it's not a valid data set and it won't be used. Changes cannot go unnoticed and tempering inconsistencies can be immediately recognized. The, the main concept um, came across. Um, what follows now is basically uh, the direct implementation. Um, so this is how it would look like um, this uh, directory structures and JSON files. So this is basically what I talked about now um, put into some um, more concrete form. And yeah, so this is an extension proposal Central proposals um, will be uh, discussed in a um, public group and um, 
uh, updated and then um, iteratively integrated. And with this, I come to the end. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you for the questions. They're um, very interesting. And I'm happy to talk further about it. Thank you, everyone.